Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. All right, I'm here on a Friday afternoon with three of my favorite people on planet Earth to talk about some dorkiness. Dan Pope, Duesh, Jonah, I don't know why I said Dan's last name, but not everybody else. Dan has a name that just sounds better as one name, like Dan Pope, you know? So everybody else, how's everyone doing on this fine Friday afternoon? Amazing. Good. Better now that we're all together. Yeah, this, this is, is the like moment I've been waiting for. for a day for me. <laughs> Jonah's, Jonah's dreams are fulfilled. Jonah is making an appearance on two podcasts now. He's, he's, that's how good he is. He's on Mike's podcast and my podcast. He's diving in both feet. Slowly moving up. <laughs> um, the purpose of this podcast is uh, came actually organically out of the new batch of students that we have at the clinic and then was kind of piggybacked off a conversation I had with Jonah, which is... Uh, I think at Champion, where we all work, is we are super lucky that we have this really blended approach of strength conditioning and medical stuff, like all overlapped in one. Like our entire system is like using strength conditioning principles whenever they're needed and having a really good understanding of that on the medical side. But the students made it very clear to me that when I wrote out a program for someone who had, I think like a back thing, I was like, oh yeah, like squat hinge, like this is how you progress it. They were like, I don't, I don't get what's happening right now, right? I have no idea. And I'm sure Duesh, as you give in services, right? You give out the programming lecture and the and like the PT students sit there, but even the strength interns sit there and like, what the yeah. hell? You're like this is what do you? This is very stressful. Like, how are you programming yeah. right now? And I think uh, in Dan and I's world, we you know we kind of grew up as like the second gens of of Lenny and Mike, but also we had like Charlie Weingroff. We could look at Cressy stuff. We could look at Mike Boyle stuff and take the best of and maybe plug it in the, in the rehab model. But a lot of people have no exposure to like programming for these types of things at all. So that's maybe the the origin story of this, but I think I'd first just want to kind of go around in a little bit of a, a circle here and, and kind of share maybe your experiences with how you got to doing both or like what your thoughts are on the fact that we have access to both. And then from there, we'll riff down into like maybe some more specific topics. But Dan, you obviously worked as a personal trainer before you were PT. So what's your experience? Are we, are we unicorns here or is this something that should be normal? Well, it is kind of funny because you know, students come into champion, they're asking questions and we're like, Oh, this is what the program looks like. We progress from here, go to here, go to there. You know, and you got to keep this in mind and that in mind. And like, you can tell it's like a deer in headlights. You just like skip 12 steps and they don't know what's going on. Right. And that's challenging because like you said, I was a strength and conditioning coach before I was a personal trainer. And I spent years and years and years learning about programming and periodization. And then I transitioned over to physical therapy. So it was kind of a, um, a good introduction, right. To strength and conditioning. And then a nice progression into physical therapy for me. I know a lot of students are kind of doing the opposite. So I often get the same question. Um, where'd you learn about programming? You know, it's, it's actually a little bit tough because I don't have any great resource where I can say, Hey, here it is, right? This is what you need to do to start with. Right. And there are some good ones. We'll chat about it. But, um, one of the things I tell students and, you know, I hate this because I'm a cat lover and I say it all the time, but there's more than one way to skin a cat, you know, <laughs> So I think you probably have to find a few kind of strength and conditioning coaches that you like. Like you we mentioned, have, Cressy. We should have put a trigger warning up there for Duesh's cat. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, guys. I love cats, but I like Let's that thing too. Now. That's a problem. But there's a lot of ways to do it. And I think you have to find something that's effective, you know, and what's nice about Champion is you already have a system. So we use that system and then we just kind of cater the individual to that system and progress from there. But uh, I guess to answer your initial question, yeah, it's a big issue. Yeah, I guess I should have said this first, but the main thing we're going to talk about and that we're going through is the difference between programming for someone in a rehab context and programming for someone who's on a sports performance context. And so that's kind of what we're, I should have said that before, but Duesh, what do you think, man? Yeah, no, I think to, to answer your, your second half of the question, are we unicorns? Um, I would say somewhat. <laughs> I, I do think the, the cool thing about the industry and the direction that it's headed in is people are starting to understand the value of having both um, or having the, the knowledge to do a little bit of both. But I think um, what kind of makes what we have going on uh, a little extra special is I think we do a good job of attaining the knowledge, but at the same time, we know that the expert on the other field is truly the expert and that's not our like area to step into. You know what I mean? Like, I think we have the awareness to serve our athletes, but we don't try to be like me and John, I don't try to be the physical therapist to solve people's pains. Right. Like you guys don't try to solve the, the person that needs high level performance. We kind of take them and give them some of the tools that might help along the process. But we kind of have a really good relationship back and forth where we feed people into the appropriate space. Um, and then as far as where I think like 
my interest kind of came about with this stuff. Um, mine was pretty, so mine was interesting because I really wanted to go to physical therapy school at the beginning of my career. Um, when I was interning at Champion, I had applied to PT schools throughout that time. And it wasn't until I got into Champion and saw that, you know, I, I could probably like have that itch scratch, so to speak, of like working with people that were in pain or people that had some dysfunction going on and stuff like that while still driving athlete performance. I think that really spoke to me because I realized that I have way more fun working with healthy athletes and, you know, really progress them up to high level performance. Um, whereas I think the, the rehabby type stuff and knowledge was more like a curiosity and like a desire to acquire that knowledge more. So it was a passion for me. Very well said. Jonah, what are your thoughts? <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so I almost did the exact opposite of what Dan did uh, out of school. I worked at a gym for a short period of time, and then I worked at a PT clinic up in Canada doing what we call, I was a kinesiologist, uh, but basically helped patients there with their rehab exercise progressions. Um, and what that kind of did was teach me that I didn't want to go to PT school. I didn't want to spend my whole time working with the injured population, but it gave me an understanding of seeing somebody through that whole process. And I wasn't necessarily in charge of the whole rehab, but I got to aid in it and got to help make some of those decisions with the um, exercise side of things. So then when I came to champion and got to have the real experts like you guys in the room next door, but also had the experience of working with injured people in the past allows me for those transition clients where they see one of you for a little bit and they're still not perfect, but they're kind of ready to move on from the one-on-one -on -one physical therapy, um, which I think is another one of the unique things we have about Champion. Um, I imagine a lot of other strength coaches know their PTs that live in their town or whatever, but it's not like here where you're still in the building. You still see that um, patient or client's face regularly after. Um, so it is pretty unique, and I think it's great because, like Dewey said, we don't have to try to be physical therapists, um, but we get to learn a little bit and – get to just walk across the room and ask you guys questions when we have some. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, I want to spend most of the time kind of digging into like practical, like really helpful things, but it's just so important that someone who's either doing their CSCS or someone who's on the physical therapy side is that you're splitting your time between both the academic stuff and then the, the hands-on coaching people stuff. And I think that's usually where people get into hot water is like, you know, not to knock, but like physical therapists are famous for being like massive dorks, but not actually like, treating people hands-on coaching a deadlift, you know, having modifications in mind and coaching on the fly. And that was one of the most valuable things that I learned from you guys early on working at champion that I still learned. Like, I think like literally like yesterday I asked Jonah about a crossover step and like a couple of days ago, I asked Duesh about like, why are you doing med ball slams off an elevated box? Or even Dan, I ask about like questions all the time. And it's the ability to read, you know, literature and understand the biomechanics or pathomechanics of injuries, but then also really have the skill set of coaching someone on the fly and knowing what looks good or not looks good or why somebody can't get in a proper hinge or what they can do. But then as your guys position as, as uh, strength coaches, you also have dipped your toes a little bit into our world of understanding like, well, what are we trying to do from an injury point of view to slowly load tissue to get them back to a, you know, a, a double TRX elevated split squat, like two Eric's pads in a TRX. Like we do that really early after like a label repair or like an ACL of like, Oh, I understand where you're trying to enter and like, you guys would very rarely probably use something like that unless someone was really deconditioned. But in your mind, when you see us do it, you're like, oh, that makes sense. And you can see where they're coming from when they get back to you. And it's like, okay, this person had a back thing. I'm thinking about someone that Jonah and I both kind of share together. I'm like, yeah, like hinging is probably like in the second to third program because he had a gnarly sciatica, you know, like it's just not going to go well. Like I know you, there's many ways to get a hinge, but like Jonah understands like, oh, sciatica, I know what sciatica is. I understand disc mechanics. I understand a little bit about that. He doesn't have to be a physical therapist, but he really does understand why hinging is probably not going to be tolerated well versus if you're a strength coach who never even investigates that, you're like, screw that, we're hinging, you know, like, and you fire somebody up, like, that's, that's really going to get you in hot water pretty quick. You yeah. know, I'd say the flip side of that too, Dave, is that I think a lot of times um, some strength coaches will do the opposite. It's like, okay, well, I don't understand back pain, so I'm not going to do anything related to the back, mm -hmm. right? So you have like an avoidance. Um, kind of take or attitude. And then that's also not a great place to be either. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the one paper, I, I do remember this paper coming out in 2015 that I'll share the screen on is this was the first paper that I really saw that was really, really like a cool introduction into like strength conditioning for 
physical therapist. And so if you guys are looking for like something academic to look at, this is by Dan Lorenz and Scott Morrison, who are studs when it comes to terms of like this kind of like a uh, concept, I guess. But they actually have this really great paper that's um, concepts about periodization for strength and conditioning. And I think they do a really good job of framing up periodization in the rehab setting. But what this doesn't do is get really nitty gritty into the actual programming pieces of like squat, hinge, push, pull. Like I think that maybe like Mike Boyle might have popularized the first person is really a model he uses. Then obviously Eric Cressy and then Mike, our you know, boss, Mike Ronald is big on too. But this is a cool like periodization paper. But I think where it gets lost in the in the gray context is, okay, what do you do to build a program, which is exactly what we want to talk about, which is like, what needs to go into a program to help somebody out? And the first thing to kind of uh, talk about, which is what Jonah brought up the other day, which is really important is, Dan, what are the goals of a rehab program? And then maybe Duesh and Jonah can talk about what are the goals of a sports performance strength and conditioning program? Because if you don't understand that from a foundational level, it doesn't make sense of why we do nine knee exercises, you know, <laughs> like they might do one. So Dan, what do you think is like the main, I guess, goal or limiting factors with like a rehab program? Let's use like, uh, we'll go into a case, Dan, but what's the main goal? You know, I this gets complicated, right? Because you have the term programming, you have the term periodization, you know, what does all this stuff mean? I think that gets to be a little bit confusing. Um, I like the term long-term planning, right? Cause I think that kind of encompasses exactly what you're trying to do and to make it even more simple and probably making it a little too simplistic. You just think about where is the individual right now and where do they need to be? And for an athlete, obviously, there's a bunch of different buckets they need to have filled. They need to be strong, need to build power, right? We need to, to build their conditioning, whatever it is. Their sport requires a lot of jumping, landing, changing direction. There's going to be nuances from sport to sport, obviously. And you see where they start, right? And let's say, I don't know, post-op ACL or something along those lines. We have to really respect the healing tissue. And as a physical therapist, you know what's important that you have to build. So we obviously need to make sure that we build quad strength over the course of time. We have to get back to basic move, movement patterns like squatting, lunging, jumping, running eventually. So I think what the competent physical therapist does well is they're very good at figuring out what the person eventually needs and coming up with very in-depth progressions along the way to get from point A to point Z, right? And I think oftentimes that really you need to have a good understanding of the sport and what you're trying to get back to as well, um, which makes it hard for physical therapists. And I think at the end of the day, it's, it's okay if you don't specialize in everything. Right. And to be honest, like I'm a champion and I, I'm probably, I know less about baseball than anyone else there. And it's like a baseball facility, but I am really good at writing rehab programs for Olympic weightlifters. Um, but to be honest, some of the other clinicians would probably have a tougher time writing a, pr a program for Olympic weightlifter. Right. Um, but that's okay because we have other professionals that can help with that. But, um, I guess, you know, this is a large thing to tackle, but figure out what the needs are of the athlete, figure out where they're beginning. Right. Of course you have some milestones you want to hit from a physical therapy perspective and just be very diligent about checking off all the boxes as you go and making sure you're not skipping a lot of steps in the mix. Mm, yeah, I think it's a great place to start. And I think that's really the two biggest things, which is you have to know where they're going, right? What's the end goal, whether it's weightlifting, whether it's gymnastics, whether it's baseball, whatever. But also <clears throat> the thing that's very different about physical therapy rehab programs that are kind of on the sporting side is you have to really have a good understanding of how the tissue was injured in the first place. Because if you don't understand the mechanism of injury, how that injury occurred and like what the surgery was that they went through you're not going to have a really good understanding of what exercises might be more stressful or less stressful on that tissue. And so that's why we've learned from Mike and Lenny is like, get the radiology report, talk to the surgeon, really have a good subjective evaluation and understand how they got hurt because that's going to dictate if certain patterns of your programming are going to be more or less beneficial. They're all going to be beneficial at some point in time, but the hinge pattern in a flexion intolerant disc versus the very knee dominant squatting pattern in an ACL with a patellar tendon graft, those are very, very murky water sometimes to dance into, but I think, I think it's a really good place to start. And then on the flip side of that, so, so Duesh now, like from a sports performance point of view, what are your like big rocks or things you're trying to look at when you start thinking about a program? Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to start with the general. And I, you know, I think the cool thing is it's probably going to sound a lot like what Dan has already said, but maybe just one step beyond. And what I mean by that is like Dan said, I think number one is you got to do a needs analysis, right? You got to figure out what is it that the athlete needs for the demands of their life, their sport, whatever, whatever it is. Um, I think where the two lanes for PT and strength conditioning separate is you guys are probably focused a lot more on 
bringing the athlete back to their normal, right? Whatever that means. Whereas um, our goal probably is the supra normal, meaning let's get them better at everything within the demands of their sport, better than they are right now and better than they've ever been. So, you know, everything from um, a capacity standpoint to a strength, you know, mobility, stability, um, strength, power, change direction, like all these qualities that we want to try to improve within an athlete, uh, we're probably trying to take them to the next level or, you know, better than they've ever been versus you guys are trying to bring them back to being able to do that stuff in general. Sure. That makes sense. Jonah, what do you think? Um, yeah, everything Dewey said spot on. I think two of the biggest differences I kind of see is in terms of timeline timelines, and then in terms of like guardrails that we have up. So in terms of timelines, ours is kind of infinite. If we're working with a kid who's 14 years old and eventually they're hoping that they might play a college sport or anything like that, we can think in like four, five, six, seven year timelines to a degree. So we don't want to rush that process. We don't want to get to our end level within six months because where do we go from there? Um, then are they just doing the same thing over and over and over again? Uh, whereas for you guys, if you're working with an ACL, you probably have a eight or so whatever month timeline where that's the end. And hopefully you never have to work with them again because they're doing really well at that point. Um, and then the other piece I think is with like the guardrails where like you were talking about, Dave, you're limited by the tissues you're trying to work on. Um, whereas we don't really have those limits. So I think it's important for us to put those limits up for ourselves. We could have a, again, a 15 year old kid who's never really lifted before. And we could start with clean and jerks if we really wanted to. Would that be a good idea? Probably not. There's probably some really base level places to start that are going to be a much better option. Um, but we have to kind of identify those for ourselves. Whereas as long as you know that pathology that the um, patient you're working with is coming from, I imagine a lot of those guardrails are kind of put in place for you. Yeah. Unless you're Dan son, Luke, who's probably cleaning jerking right now. <laughs> <laughs> Where, where's um, he at? <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's actually asleep in the other yep. room at six. So let's hope he doesn't wake up. <laughs> cause, cause he's tired from clean and jerking. <laughs> he's way too much. Yeah. He's puking. Maxed out. Too hard. Um, I think the other uh, kind of just one layer deeper to kind of double click in more on this is I think that within like, which is, I mean, knee seems to be the thing we're going to talk about just because it's the easiest kind of low hanging fruit to talk about. But like when you have someone who's had an ACL injury, for example, for us as rehab providers, there's a lot of different caveats within that injury that can make things more or less, you know, progressive or conservative, which is a, an ACL in isolation versus an ACL with a patellar tendon graft versus a hamstring graft changes what patterns you're going to load more or less in the beginning but then you start to get to like okay like acl plus meniscus acl plus microfracture like there's a lot of different complexity layers that dictate who's going to tolerate certain patterns more or less and i think for you what i've understood from watching you guys program is like while you may say okay everybody should do all these athletic qualities programming for a baseball player versus a soccer player versus a gymnast is going to be very, very different because the demands of that sport, like baseball is very much rotational power or say gymnastics, for example, it's very much vertical jumping and landing is probably more. So they should all be pro like in the bucket of what we're working, but there's certain things you lean into more or less, but even within that sport, there's like, you know, a center fielder versus a pitcher, right? For example. And I think that's, again, the needs analysis gets so much more uh, important because Yes, you all have the baseline things, but then you start to kind of go further, further more in the same way that we have. Yes, it's an ACL, but there's also a meniscus or there's a microfraction. So each person has their own extra layers they have to go. But those things are really what enable you to make a program that's super specific for what they need. Am I, am I wrong there? Is that correct? I think that's spot on. Solid. Cool. Okay. So let's do this. I think the best way to maybe, uh, paint some parallels between a rehab and a program. And for the rehab side is maybe taking uh, selfishly taking a gymnast who's like 16 years old. And for you guys, so they're like a year out of an ACL, they have like no issues at all. Like they've been cleared, they're fine. They're back to sports, but you know, the PT or doctor was like, Hey, you know, it'd probably be a good idea for you to start a strength conditioning program because you know, it's high risk and you might re injure. So, you know, they walk in the door to champion and sit down with an assessment for you for their off season training is in your mind. I think obviously big rocks first, but then as we, I want to try to dig into like what a program looks like, but maybe do first and Jonah in terms of, of what are you thinking about when you're sitting down with that person who's trying to, you know, just like you said, elevate performance more so than just rehab now. Yeah. So big thing for me is, you know, and you said it, the, the subjective assessment at the very beginning, I do want to understand the, the background of the injury, the, the mechanisms, of the injury, um, and all that stuff. And then try to get a little bit more insight into what kind of, the, what kind of surgery it was, how the rehab went and all that. 
uh, subjective, very, very important. And then as far as my actual objective assessment is going to be our movement screen, that's going to give us an idea of how well the overall body moves. Um, and then maybe see if there is any compensations happening due to the injury in the past, which is, you know, ACL in this case. Um, now we also might dig a little bit deeper and go into, you know, some table testing to see a little bit more joint by joint. Um, and then, you know, coming out of that, a nice thorough performance assessment where we test speed, agility, power, um, and the current capacity of that is going to give us quite a bit of an insight. Now, if they're currently healthy, you know, we should be able to measure them up to an athlete that wasn't injured, right? That didn't have an ACL tear. So we can look at our normative data and say, all right, if you are a healthy athlete now, even though you had that ACL surgery in the past, you should compare well to all of our other athletes that never had that ACL surgery, right? So that almost gives us like an idea of how well their rehab went. Because if they are still weak and maybe they don't produce as much force or as much power as, you know, some of their peers, even though they're a good athlete, let's say, um, we have an idea of what kind of stuff might be things that we still need to focus on because of that past that ACL injury. Um, so our needs analysis essentially just grows a little bit more where if they are completely normal or they present normal through all of our testing and assessments, then we're going to treat them like a completely healthy athlete. Whereas if I see that they're maybe, you know, lagging behind in certain areas um, because they were injured, whatever, a year ago or, you know, whenever the injury was, um, then I probably have to change my approach a little bit and give them a little bit more of the isolated strength or maybe the dynamic stability, you know, and all those things. And I can kind of let, I'll let Jonah go into a little bit more of the, the longer term stuff, but that's where I would yeah. start. Fire away, Jonah. Yeah, I would say, so then from there, once you've done everything Dewey just talked about, once it comes down to choosing what they're going to do on an individual day, as you already said, Dave, at this point, the doctor wants them getting strong. Hopefully they're moving much better at the end of their rehab. So I want to pick the movements that they're going to be able to load up well and start to really prioritize intensity when it comes to their workout. So I don't want to give them six different lower body exercises to do, especially if they're only coming in uh, two times a week, maybe each day it's two lower body exercises, one that's some sort of hinge and one that's some sort of knee dominant. And each day, maybe one of those is a single leg or like a split pelvis lunge type position. That way they can actually put a high level of effort into each of those and really try to push those. And then as Dewey said, if they have um, any sort of like, say their hamstring's still weak, then we can always add in some isolation hamstring work from there. But I want to start to probably cut down on the number of total exercises they're doing so they can really hone in on those few they are. So like I said, maybe one day they're doing a front squat and another day they're doing a trap bar deadlift. And then those are paired up with a lunge variation and a uh, split stance RDL or something like that. Um, but yeah, I think the biggest thing at this point is really starting to just allow them to build that intensity um, for both the strength stuff, but also with those power exercises. So finding the jump variations or the med ball variations that will allow them to really express their power so that we can start truly building that and building for the long term and building those qualities up. Yeah. And then just to follow up on this more, because I think this is actually a common point that overlaps is the patterns that we use to train different qualities. I think that something that we do really well at champion is we, we kind of all understand the basic patterns that somebody should be able to do from a strength point of view. And we find different entry points of that. So maybe Duesh, can you just chat about for the lower body to keep it simple? Like what are those patterns that we're trying to maybe tap into and train wholeheartedly? And then we can shift to Dan who's really good about kind of finding different variations within those patterns. I'll, uh, I'll do you one better. We'll talk patterns and planes <laughs> <laughs> bonus. Um, no, but this is, um, I, I do think this is one of those things that's missed on for a lot of younger professionals. Um, cause I feel like I, I seem to be having this conversation with our interns and PT students all the time. Like every, every new batch that we have, this ends up becoming a focus point. Um, but for the lower body, um, our major movement patterns, if we can classify it well, would be, um, about a bilateral squat, right? So two feet together, moving straight up and down. That means hips go down primarily, um, a bilateral hinge, which is going to be two feet together. Hips are moving back more than they are going down. Um, our next pattern is going to be a lunge or a split pelvis where, um, one leg is out in front, the other leg is out in the back. Um, now in the split pelvis, you can do either a knee dominant where it's a little bit more like a lunge, or you can do a little bit more like an RDL or a hinge, like a stagger stance. Um, deadlift or an RDL where the hips are translating back a little bit more, right? So as you guys can imagine, we're kind of talking planes already a vertical versus horizontal movement. Um, and then from there, we have our true single leg, whether it's a hinge 
or a squat. So like a single leg RDL where one leg is on the ground, the other leg is completely unsupported. So we don't have that split pelvis. It's just a complete um, one leg movement. Um, we have one leg hinge where the hips are moving back um, and forward. And then we have a one leg squat where the hinge or sorry, the, the hips are moving straight up and down and the other leg is unsupported. Um, so if you guys can kind of imagine planes in this scenario, if we are bilateral, meaning both feet are side to side and on the ground, we don't have a whole lot of a requirement for side to side stability or rotational stability or competency, right? So this in nature is a little bit more what we call sagittal plane movement, where things are a little bit more up and down, um, and forward and back. If we're talking about a hinge, whereas as soon as we go to a split pelvis position where one leg is more of a support and it's not producing the force. We actually have to have competency to be able to not let our body completely flip over to one side um, or rotate and twist with whatever amount of weight that we have. Um, so we're going to have a little bit more competency within the frontal plane, which is our side to side motions um, and transverse plane, which is our rotational plane of motion. Um, so now if you can imagine if we now get rid of even that little bit of support or balance leg from the, the split pelvis movement and we go into true single leg, we have way more of a demand for side to side stability and rotational stability and, and control. So this is where we're going to see the highest demand of stability frontal plane and transverse plane. Um, now, a little bit of the trade-off here is going to be when do you use what? Our bilateral movements, meaning we have the most amount of stability into the ground, we're going to use to help our athletes produce the most amount of force, right? Or be challenged with the most amount of weight so they can get better at producing force. Whereas a true single leg movement, which we talked about, has the least amount of stability. We're probably not going to be able to load that up as much as our bilateral exercises. Right. And, you know, for those of you that have maybe heard the debate of what's better, you know, single leg movements or two legged movements. And, you know, if anyone's listened to our podcast with with Mike's podcast, um, our answer is always going to be do both. Um, but we got to know the reasons of why we do both. So bilateral for more strength gain unilateral or split pelvis for a little bit more motor control or stability gain. Mm. Yeah. That's a really good way to kind of look at it from a, an overview level of like, okay, these are the patterns that I think are beneficial to train. And here are the different, you know, buckets I have to try to attain throughout a program. And then Dan, so let's now maybe kind of shift it back to our perspective, which is, cause this is, I think where the big commonality overlaps, which is these patterns that we want to get back to, but say, let's go somebody who's maybe, you know, four months out of an ACL, they had a patellar tendon graft and we're dealing with, They've, you know, let's make the assumption they've got their patellar mobility back, full extension, like their swelling is down, their quad strength, they can walk normal. Like they've passed the milestones of just basic, you know, ADLs, which is kind of the early rehab phase. When you start building a two day program for someone like that, I think the important thing to highlight here, what we do really well is like you're probably looking at those same patterns. Am I correct? You're like, okay, I gotta, I gotta get a squat, I gotta get a hinge, a split pelvis, a step up, all that kind of stuff. How are you looking at those patterns and programming? A day versus you know just the generalized sports performance program yeah for sure you know and it's funny it's it just even thinking about it it's fairly complex right because you have to know how to do strength conditioning and then you have to be able to respect whatever injury you're dealing with right um i think the thing that's interesting about the acl and this is going to be very different than even like another like knee surgery like a meniscus repair right is that we're thinking about how much quad you're using and how much stress falls on the graft right and if you're four months out, there's a good chance that you can do a lot of stuff, right? It's not like you're two months in, the graft is at its weakest, and we're really concerned about stretching this thing. So that's a, a difference that's going to be in my mind, right? So there's two things I'm thinking about. A, how do we build this person back to all the qualities, the sport uh, they need for their sport, excuse me, right? Uh, but the second piece is where are their weaknesses currently, and how do we bolster that, right? So you can kind of go two ways. So Early on, let's say a couple months prior to that four month mark, when I'm squatting with someone, I'm probably being really cautious about how far the knees are sent forward because that's just going to put more stress on the ACL graft. But I know that if I send my hips back a little bit more or just squat normally and don't do, let's say, a sissy squat, the stress on that graft is very, very little, right? I'm going to build that squat and I can probably introduce that pretty early. I'm going to push it as hard as I can early on while respecting that knee, right? I don't want to flare it up and get it really upset. I think when we think about, let's say an ACL reconstruction, we don't want to stretch the graft. But the other thing is that you have a freshly, you know, surgerized, I don't even know if that's a word, knee that can't handle a ton, right? It now. Yeah. It's so surprised. it's like, all right, I have to be careful with the graft, but you also have to keep in mind this person had surgery a bit ago, right? And they're probably weaker from that. They're swelling, right? There's inhibition. There are a lot of things to think about. 
But generally speaking, I want to push the strength as much as I can early on while still protecting that graft. So for an ACL around eight weeks, I'm starting to squat and I'm really starting to load that squat because it's probably pretty safe for the graft. And if it's well tolerated and not making the athlete or individual lose range of motion um, or get swollen, then I'm going to try to push as much as I can. Uh, once they get to the four month mark, I'll probably strength test around three months or so. I know some folks will strength test before that, but let's say the quads weak, which we know it is for a lot of these ACL folks, I might start to change some of the squat variations to emphasize quad strength, right? So early on, I was careful with the amount of quad I was pushing uh, because I didn't want to stretch that graph. But as I get further along, it's like, whoa, heck, man, we got to climb back up this hill of getting the quad strong again. And for the ACL particularly, but really any kind of knee pathology, we know that quad is incredibly important, you know, uh, to be able to perform things like, you know, jump tests and landing well and being able to land in more knee flexion. So you're less likely to land stiff and then potentially tear your ACL again. So uh, one easy way to tweak some of these movements, right? So we can use a squat as an example, but it, it's kind of the same for, um, let's say a single legged exercise, like a single legged squat or, um, whatever type of split pelvis exercise, may that be like a step up or lunge, we can make it more quad dominant by trying to drive the knee forward more so, right? So think about in a squat, the difference between a heels elevated, let's say squat with a, a goblet where the knee really travels forward a lot. You increase the moment arm for the knee to do work, which just makes it harder for the knee and harder for the quad, subsequently easier on the hip. So if you're not loading the hip and you feel like you need to load the hip, then that's probably not the only movement you want to incorporate into that athlete's program. Um, but we're thinking about trying to increase some of the stress on that knee. Uh, subsequently, you may have someone that's at four months where their knee just doesn't feel great. And you're like, well, I don't think I can push this at this point. And I'll tell you what. Maybe there's some other ways to get some quad strength. Maybe you're doing things like blood flow restriction training, which is a little less stressful on the knee in general to improve some of that quad strength. But I wouldn't just go ahead and, and push like a heels elevated squat unless it's well tolerated. Um, so again, yes, I'm thinking about the needs analysis at three months. What's the strength? Is a quad weak? If it's weak, we have to continue pushing it, right? Isn't the irritated? Can we actually afford to push it, right? And then you make decisions based off of that. Um, but yeah, I, I think... Um, kind of talking about the role discussion you talked about before for us as physical therapists, I think we need to know which movements are going to stretch the graft, right? Uh, when we can push some of these movements and for the strength conditioning professionals, it becomes, okay, what's that needs analysis and what do we need to start pushing when it's safe? When we have that clearance from the doc or when from the, the physical therapist, like we're so lucky to have a champion, you know? Yeah. And I think this is a really good area to kind of, uh, kind of go more into, because I think, one thing I learned from you that was really beneficial is the understanding how different types of exercise in the same category stress different things, right? So like hip versus knee dominant squats, for example, <clears throat> and I have a, like, I'll pull up one of your graphs here from your website is like, if somebody has a patellar tendon graft or a quad graft, we're going to be very, not nervous, but just hesitant to load very quad dominant exercises first, but we could probably load the crap out of things like kettlebell deadlifts because they're a little bit more hinge, you know, based, or we, like you said, in keeping in squat pattern, you could low bar back squat somebody to a box and really shift those hips back versus if somebody had a hamstring graft, that low bar back squat might be very provocative and we don't want to load the graft for at least six weeks. And if we're looking at four months, we're just very cautious, but a goblet squat with a really upright torso might really help that person get a squat pattern, but not cause that. And so I think I want to maybe pull up this, uh, continuum you have, this is from the hip, but it's the same kind of continuum aspect. And then maybe shift gears and talk about how we do have a lot of tools at our disposal to do different things. It's not always about more load. We can, we can have range of motion we can have all sorts of different, you know, BFR metabolic stress, tempo pause, and maybe think about how that's another tool that we have to manipulate the variables when it's not only about load maybe jonah and duesh can talk about all those different things but dan can you walk through maybe this because this was a very helpful for me to understand from you about like oh i understand things stress certain areas more or less and based on the pathology they have for say an acl for example you can kind of program a squat still but a, a maybe a, a goblet squat with with uh lightweight and bfr versus a low bar back squat can you maybe just chat about this concept yeah for sure and i think kind of goes back to your um initial talk about mechanisms of injury and this graph, I mean, this infographic isn't completely fair for all pathologies, right? So if you have like, let's say glute medius tendinopathy that behaves a little bit differently than a femoral acetabular impingement syndrome, right? So even based on that, it's going to vary somewhat. Uh, but generally speaking on the far left of this graph, you have a back squat, more of a low bar back squat, right? 
And on the far right, you're going over towards more goblet squat where, where you're much more upright. So if you think about common hip pathologies and FAI and glute medius tendinopathy would fall into this, the more hip flexion you fall into, the more stress goes on to the hip in the injured area. So like an FAI, the more flexion you get, the more compression is in the front part of the hip. So if you're doing a barbell back squat, as you get to the bottom part of the squat and you're really aggressively sending those hips back, there's a lot of hip flexion. Okay. And if you start going more towards the right, let's say you have a goblet squat. And if you look at the torso angle, it's upright, there's a little less hip flexion. So you're decreasing the amount of stress from that perspective, right? The other thing to think about, and I have some lines, I have some other good graphs. This one doesn't have it, but it's a little complicated to understand. The more you send the hips back in a given squat, the longer the moment arm grows and the more challenge you're now placing on the hip, right? So if you do a barbell back squat, you are increasing the amount of hip flexion, which is going to be a little tougher for someone that has, let's say, FAI or glute medius tendinopathy, right? You're also putting more load on those structures. So now they have to be able to handle more as well. So it's going to make the hip musculature just have to work harder. If you compare that to like a goblet squat or a split squat on the far right, you're very, very upright. The knee is driven forward more so. The knee is helping out more, right? So you're putting the knee in a good position to produce force. The hip in a not so good position to produce force. You're still making the movement challenging by adding load. But you're trading some of that stress off. I love the saying. I don't know if anyone uses this anymore, and I probably need to get a, a better saying, but robbing Peter to pay Paul. I think that's biblical or something. But basically, <laughs> you're trading the stress off, right? You're taking the stress from one area and just throwing it somewhere else which is kind of nice because we still want a hard exercise that's challenging. It's just that for the particular injury, we're able to dose stress more appropriately. So if you have someone kind of going back to our original example with, let's say, um, some sort of ACL reconstruction, right? Maybe it's a patellar graph just to make it a little bit more simple. Uh, early on in the rehab, maybe you start with a bilateral load where you're sending the hips back more so, kind of like a, a back squat pattern. Um, and as you start to get a little bit further along in rehab and you want to increase some of the stress on the patellar tendon, and then you can tolerate a little more stress on that graft. You might creep over more towards the front squat as you add more load over the course of time. Um, so you can very easily dose up the stress or dose down the stress. Uh, and this is obviously important from post-op perspective, but it's really important for any injury. I think for any injury, learning how to dose exercise is incredibly important and it's not that complicated. I think we do a really good job of rehabbing our patients better if we just understand a couple of these principles. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's a really good kind of commonality to establish as a strength coach, or as a rehab provider, say for a lower body injury, you're trying to get back to squat, hinge, split pelvis, a single leg and accessory work. That's a really good, like kind of foundational level. And I think what happens here is we, we realize that, okay, that's the goal, but there's a lot of different ways, like you said, to get to that pattern that you need. And I think that's where the conversation then shifts to talking about students, we talk about like, okay, well, what are the things at your disposal that you can manipulate? Obviously exercise selection is one of them, but Jonah, maybe like, what are the other things that you guys are playing around with in terms of like range of motion or tempo? So one is what are the different variables you're manipulating? And then from a sports performance context, why are you manipulating those things? And why might you change the exercise selection versus when well, I'll come back and I'll talk about, you know, like, you know, why we would use one versus the other for pain modulation. Yeah. So, um, you already said a couple of those variables where say we're taking a split squat, for example, we can shorten up the range of motion, uh, or we can change the loading position. Kind of like what Dan was talking about, where we could go goblet, we could go two dumbbells, we could go a barbell on somebody's back. Um, we can change the tempo so we can go slower eccentrics. We can do ISO holds. Um, I'd say those are kind of the main variables within any one exercise on top of the stuff Dan talked about as well, in terms of like how much forward lean you have can impact just for, uh, for your split pelvis position stuff, whether it's more hip or knee dominant as well. Um, so a couple different ways in which we would use that. One is kind of as a learning tool. Um, so as somebody is newer to the gym, I like to kind of start them out with almost more naturally challenging positions. Um, so like a goblet or a unilateral dumbbell, um, regardless of which hand, which is gonna make it a less stable environment, which is gonna kind of cause them to slow down a little bit and really take their time to learn the exercise. Uh, 
Um, once we have the fundamentals of the exercise down, now we want to start adding load to it. So now we can start going with two dumbbells, um, something that's naturally a little more stable, like what Dewey was talking about earlier, um, so that we can start to push the load and really build the strength. So early on, we're trying to build the movement pattern. We want to challenge the stability a little bit, make them get comfortable. Then we want to let them load it up. Then the, from there, we can also start to add in speed as different variables. So whether it's tempos, again, to slow them down, almost add more metabolic stress to it. So slow eccentrics, more time under tension, going to help with hypertrophy. Whereas on the flip side, we can start to add speed to the movement um, to really try to enhance the neurological adaptations we're getting. So when once the athletes gain the movement pattern, they've gained some good strength with it. They've started to develop some good hypertrophy and their strength levels are pretty good. And we want to start transitioning more to the power side. We'll start to get them to do those exact same movements, but moving as fast as they can um, or finding kind of a moderate load where they're moving relatively fast. So uh, we can transition from more of like the metabolic stress to more mechanical stress by adding load to more neurological stress by adding some speed to that movement. Yeah, it's really funny you mentioned that because commonality between what you might see, like I said, at that one year ACL when you guys are taking someone or a four month ACL when we're taking them is in a two day program, it'd probably be squat on one day, hinge on one day, split pelvis on one day, single leg on the other day. And they would look the same. But the difference being is that, and I think I talked to Joan about this the other day is like, from our point of view is we're trying to stress the knee in a variety of different ways to rebuild the baseline capacity to tolerate load. So I'm trying to help somebody get back as much different force vectors and stresses they're going to take to just keep building up the tolerance of their knee. So it might be a goblet squat to a box and a uh, glute bridge, right? Cause they had a, a, uh, a knee injury or whatever. And then it might be a regular split squat with a TRX because they can't quite tolerate, you know, body weight split squats without pain anymore. Right. And then on a single leg exercise it might just be a really low box step up because that's all they can tolerate. But the goal for us is still to get all of the main things they need to load that lower body. Whereas you're looking at it from, I'm trying to get the most out of adaptation that I can to get them stronger, to get them to be bridging over to power. And I think that's a really cool way to kind of think about it, which is like, okay, when you're making a program, you want to have all the main lower body movements in there for the upper body. It's vertical pushing and pulling and horizontal pushing and pulling and accessory work. The same thing for the core, right? Anti-flexion, extension, side bending, rotating. I'm trying in a, in a back pain program is to get all of those types of vectors in because I want to stress the back in a variety of ways to build up its tolerance and reduce pain from coming on. Right. And that's a really cool way to think about it is, is, is you have the patterns, but then for a rehab provider, you can manipulate the same things that you were talking about to try to make it more tolerable. Right. So say for example, and Dan has good, again, really good infographics on this. It's like, say you want to get somebody back to a split pelvis position, but they're really not tolerating split spots. Well, well, maybe we can add two air axes and reduce the range of motion. Maybe we can then do a TRX assistance and that for a week. And then we take an air X away. Then we take the TRX away and that's how they progress versus for you guys, you're trying to find the the entry point that loads and gets the most adaptation. Whereas we're trying to find the entry point that is tolerated pain wise, the most comfortably, if that makes sense. And so that's two different, and that's the two commonalities I see in programming for these two things, which is patterns are the same. The manip the variables you can manipulate are the same, but the limiting factor is different, which is pain versus sports performance. And, and I guess movement capacity is, is a piece of it too, right? Yeah. I think a really interesting example of that is limiting the range of motion on a squat where Dan was talking about with FAI or I'm sure a variety of different injuries, you're going to limit how deep someone squats by going to a box. Um, and you're doing that to make it more tolerable, just like you were talking about. Whereas on our end, once somebody's hit a really good level of a deep squat, they don't necessarily need to keep building on that for their sport. And there's a lot of research that shows half squats and quarter squats actually carry over more to speed, uh, like to sprinting speed than a full squat does. So we want to build up those full ranges of motion to a certain level, but we don't have to stay there forever or we don't have to stay there year round. We'll spend bits of time where we are working in shorter ranges of motion so that we can load the exercise more. So you're using that to make it tolerable. We're using it to just add more load. Yeah. And then another commonality before we go into something, maybe a little different pivot here is so the, the patterns you're using might be the same in both programs the variables you can manipulate are also the same, but another commonality is the quality of the motion, right? Like you're not going to, you're not going to progress somebody to a harder exercise if they're struggling or it doesn't look that great. Like the, 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 a hinge should be a hinge, a squat should be a squat. And if someone's either 
really struggling to do the basic version of that, it's not going to make sense to progress them. For us, that's because pain is probably going to come into the equation for you guys. Well, you're starting to losing the, you're losing the goal of, of what the exercise is. And so those three things are common between both programs, the, you know, the, the patterns, the, the ways you can change it. And then also the actual quality of the movement. I think the next piece of the conversation that's really important is when we talk about, okay, so we have our exercises, squat, hinge, split pelvis, step up, and maybe in the PT side, it's accessory work to isolate quad or hamstring. You guys have your own accessory work. Maybe it's upper body mixed in two in a program, but now it's about sets and reps and, and volume management of like, okay, what are we doing differently maybe in a rehab side for sets and reps versus what are we doing on a sports performance sets and reps so maybe dan can talk about the rehab side of what you would start on sets and reps where somebody has that four-month graph versus duesh can talk about when someone starts their sports performance program they've never trained before but they're a year out from their acl what are you trying to start with yeah for sure um i think it kind of kind of goes back to what we talked about uh, earlier you just kind of need a needs analysis right um so going back to our acl individual so early on after surgery i love saying this the uh the quad's like a bowl of mashed potatoes right it doesn't fire that well right and probably what we need to get that quad working well early on is a lot of volume a lot of practice to restore the volitional control of the quad right so i may give people sets of 5 10 15 20 25 there it is. There's your quad. <laughs> it looks delicious with the garlic all over it and butter. <laughs> <laughs> that, that gravy. <laughs> for, for the audio listeners, that is just a Google image. <laughs> That's where we're at. Right, go ahead, Dan. Yeah. Um, but for that individual, they need a lot of volume, right? And the other part is that if you are trying to restore motor control and you get to a point where your reps are so high that your technique looks terrible, you went too high, right? So I think it's, it's partially just doing a needs analysis and figuring out what that individual needs, right? And then later on, when you need strength, we know that when we're trying to build strength, the lower repetitions are, the lower reps are going to go, right? The same thing kind of goes for power. It's hard to develop power if you're doing sets of 30. You know what I mean? It's like you're not going to be able to improve your vertical very well if every time you do box jumps, you have to do 50 in a row. It's just not going to happen, right? Um, that being said... Um, I think one simple way to load people, and I know folks tend to hate on this because maybe it's too simple and we use it too much, but I think the good old three sets of eight to 10 is a pretty dang good starting place for most things, right? I know we like to hate on it and say like, oh, you're not using your brain. You're not critically reasoning. Uh, but I'll tell you what, the large majority of sets that I prescribe for folks are three sets, of eight to 10. Uh, I think it's a good middle ground. You know what I mean? Because oftentimes I'm trying to build a little strength, a little hypertrophy. I'm starting to think about things like power. So that's a good middle road to start with most folks. I think the other part is you have to think about the needs that the individual has and just give them the rep range that targets what you need, you know, while respecting that injury, obviously. Yeah, to, to build on what Dan said, for, for those hating on three sets of 10, I guess you're going to be hating on me too, because that's probably, that's probably about where I would start. Um, and, you know, some similarities to what Dan said, but my my big point of view for why maybe start there is I get an athlete to, to practice repetitions with really good quality, right? They get enough actual exposure to that movement to get competent at that movement. Um, second, Dan also already kind of mentioned is we get to build a little bit of, of volume, a little bit of hypertrophy, uh, maybe kind of start building that foundation for strength. But then the other thing too is like, you know, I want to I wanna just build that athlete's ability to work. Like if I start them with three sets of five and they haven't trained either ever or in a really long time, they don't really know how to push heavy sets of five yet, right? So if I can start them by pushing heavy sets of eight and 10 where they're challenging and it's, you know, subjectively tough for them, they'll have a better idea, a better context of what difficulty within a rep feels like. Because I hate to say it, when it gets down to really heavy work where we're trying to build a lot of force production, the reps are going to be heavy, right? We, we want that bar if we are using a bar. Um, we want that weight to actually move slow. That is the intention of heavy work, right? It should be heavy enough where it is intentionally moving slow. Whereas on the other side of the coin, you know, I'll probably also go low, um, low number of reps if I'm trying to um, improve power, like Dan said, right? We don't want to do three sets of 15 if we're trying to build jumping power. We're probably going to do maybe three sets of four, five, six, but give them enough rest in between each rep where they're fresh and they can demonstrate max output of power to actually get them to leave the ground. Um, so yeah, I would, I would start at three sets of eight, three sets of 10, and then progress to, you know, three sets of five, five sets of five, six sets of three, you know, whatever, whatever is necessary really. <laughs> 
Yeah. And we can kind of see the picture coming together now, whereas these programs typically would have the same movement patterns, right? They would have the same structure overall of getting these things, but then maybe three by tens or four by eights or something like that is a good starting place. And again, the rate limiting factor, I think Dan and I know this pretty well is, you know, Dan's analogy is like, you're kind of making soup or is like, you try some stuff and you toss some ingredients in, you try some stuff. Whereas you guys probably have a much more um, clear path of what's going to kind of create adaptation for us. It's, it's highly variable about what someone's knee tolerates in one ACL surgery for somebody else's. So oftentimes we're starting with what we think is a good entry point, but we're like very cautiously progressing people. We're like, Oh, let's try this and see how it goes. And we have to really understand if there's pain, obviously not only during the session, but the day after, is there a swelling change? Is there a range of motion change? Is there a, a pain change and stuff like that? And we're, I, I think in my opinion, we're very much dictated by how somebody responds in a pain fashion and not so much in a soreness or we want soreness, but sometimes we kind of, we get a backfire. Do I, you got something? Yeah. I just, I just wanted to make sure that I cover this because I, I know people are either going to be questioning it or I've honestly seen it with past interns. Um, when we, when we do talk about that, um, you know, transition from higher reps to maybe lower reps, um, I would say be, you know, be cautious of what kind of exercises you're pushing to really low reps and really heavy. What I mean by that is you're probably not going to get a whole lot of benefit out of doing six sets of three on a single leg RDL. You know what mm -hmm. I mean, because again, the intention of that exercise is not load, right? So we got to, that's why I kind of mentioned the whole patterns thing of understanding what's meant to, you know, induce what kind of a response within the system is our bilateral movements are going to be good at developing force, whereas our unilateral is more for stability. If you want stability, you probably need a little bit more reps versus if you load the crap out of them on that six sets of three single leg RDL, they're probably going to be falling all over, all over the place. Quality is going to be poor. They're probably not going to be building a whole lot of dynamic stability or motor control. So I just wanted to touch on that. Vice versa, you have to understand the opposite side of that coin, which is <clears throat> there are some patterns that tolerate middle to higher reps more than others, right? Three sets of 10 goblet squats is very different than three sets of 10 front foot elevated split squats. You're going to destroy somebody because that's such a, that just a, a much more brutal single leg movement. So yeah, those are very good points. And I think, so we kind of have the foundational here are the patterns that are beneficial. Here is a set and rep that's beneficial. Here's how we can manipulate the different exercises on a rehab program versus strength and conditioning program. The next question is progression of load and progression of, of and kind of um, the cycle or so to say, or the programming. So I guess let's start with Jonah, which is what, what in your mind is the rate of progression? Like one, when do you know when to progress somebody? And also how do you progress somebody so that they're continuing to kind of make steps forward? Yeah, so I would say, a lot of that's going to depend on the training age of the athlete. Um, as a general rule of thumb, I think progression should happen pretty slowly. Um, if something's still working, I don't really see a need to change it, right? If we're doing three sets of eight and week after week after week, the person keeps going up in weight, there's no need to go lower in reps. Um, so with those younger, newer athletes or somebody who's coming off of a year-long rehab where they haven't been able to push themselves for a while, I don't think the progression needs to be super rapid. Now that doesn't mean I'm not going to change anything. So they might do one month of goblet squats, three sets of 10. The next month might be goblet squats with a two second isometric at the bottom, three sets of eight. And then they might go to slow eccentrics for three sets of eight. And that might be three months of goblet squats between eight and 10 reps. And all I've changed is the tempos, but they've continued to be able to go up and up and up in weight. Whereas for your more advanced athletes, I think things will change more and they will change quicker because you're also, you have to work that much harder to get any sort of adaptation. But I also think it's harder to really chase one adaptation for a long period of time where they're going to benefit more from variety because they're not really learning the skill of lifting anymore. You're truly trying to push them extremely hard and then back off and go push something else. Um, so as a rule of thumb, I would say progression should be slow. I don't think there's any need to try to change stuff all the time because stuff's just not going to change as quick on the strength and conditioning side. Um, let things work as long as they will. Uh, but when an athlete gets bored, because at the end of the day, they are people and we do need to make sure that they're enjoying their time. So they continue to show up and continue to train. Um, or when you start to see the adaptations or whatever, measures it is you're tracking once those start to kind of tail off then it's time to change to something new yeah john's yeah. a big muscle confusion guy <laughs> <laughs> every day something different <laughs> that makes sense so dan how about from your side in terms of like the that four month acl that's starting to you know get through those basic body weight exercises how are you progressing load and kind of what's your rate limiting factor there <laughs> 
Yeah. So you said four months or so. Yeah. I think we'll um, do the four month one. Then we'll talk about plyometrics maybe at five or six. Yeah, for sure. Like I think, a, again, it kind of comes back down to what kind of surgery you're dealing with, right? Like let's say you had a meniscus repair. I think that's a big one with the ACL. So if you have a meniscus repair and someone's non weight bearing for a little bit longer, then you're probably gonna have to wait a little bit in terms of advancements. You know what I mean? Um, I typically like to start loading folks with bilateral movements, right? Um, and it's funny because I like to start with bilateral. So let's say we start with a hinge pattern and we start with a squat pattern. And once we find they can tolerate them really well, we move immediately to uh, single legged exercises, unilateral exercises. Uh, the reason being is because a, I think that they're personally a little bit more sports specific, although we still squat and deadlift in their programs, uh, but B you're dealing with an asymmetry. So as a physical therapist, that's one of the biggest things that you can possibly do is starting to work on hammering down this insufficiency, right? Um, you know, for a lot of these folks, you know, let's say it's like a post-op labral tear, which is a little bit different than let's say an ACL tear. So an ACL, it happens all at once. Boom. You, you cut, you, you tear your ACL and, you know, hopefully you get some pre-op PT and then get surgery right away. Let's say you have a, um, a pre-op hip labral tear that's been weaker, weaker, weaker for the past six to eight months. Then you have surgery get even weaker, right? Now you're dealing with something that's even more deconditioned. So the asymmetry is even more important, right? Um, but that being said, once folks are able to handle the bilateral loading, we go to very easy variations of single-legged loading. I like step-ups, single-legged squats, single-legged deadlifts. Um, I usually incorporate very partial range of motion initially. So think about a TRX-assisted split squat where you have a bunch of, as you said, air is behind the backside knee, so the range is really, really small. I'll do a super short step up to the point where it's like embarrassing for the patient, right? Cause they're inside of a strength conditioning gym and you know, they're, you know, an athlete doing like a four inch, two to four inch step up with a TRX assist. You know what I mean? Uh, but I think that's actually really important. Uh, I like kickstand single legged squats that are very high. Right. And in terms of uh, single legged deadlift variations, you should have starting with a single legged like, balance and maybe adding a bit of a reach. And over the course of time, we add a little more load, a little more range of motion, and then eventually more speed. Um, the one thing to be on your radar, right, is going to be moving outside of the sagittal plane, right? And Duesh already talked about that, but typically I like to have a couple weeks of working within the sagittal plane before I think frontal. And unfortunately, this is challenging for the PTs out there. You got to think about the pathology. So like, for example, a lateral lunge is very low stress on an ACL graft, right? Compared to, let's say, a, a sagittal plane lunge. But if you have like, let's say, some sort of meniscus pathology on the medial or lateral side of the joint, you probably have to be a little bit more cautious with your introduction of frontal plane movements over like an ACL reconstruction uh, where the graft is being stressed the same exact amount with a lateral lunge versus a sagittal plane. So usually sagittal for a few weeks and then progress the frontal, but also be mindful of the injury that you have, right? Yeah. I think this, this recurring theme keeps coming up, which is you really have to do your diligence about understanding the pathology and what tissue is stressed and what type, right? And I think even with a meniscus repair, you could have someone who has an anterior horn lesion, right? And hyperextension or extension is really not going to be tolerated really well versus someone who has a posterior root tear, that deeper range of flexion is going to be the thing that you're really concerned about. And same thing with cartilage, right? Like cartilage mapping is all over the place in terms of what part of the knee is engaging or when the hip, what tight it's engaging. So a PT has to do a really good job of understanding where that stress is because like you said, somebody who has a hamstring strain is not going to tolerate front to back maybe as well as side to side versus someone who has like a lateral glute tendinopathy side to side, it's going to feel terrible to start with. So you got to understand which way they're kind of moving in and how to stress that tissue slowly. And this naturally kind of progresses to, I think what the last topic I think we can touch on, which is when you're starting to introduce plyometrics and impact and running and stuff like that. And Jonah and I, Jonah had a really good point, which is like the semantics around what we call things sometimes confuses people because you know, what I say is a bound Jonah might say is something else or the actual terminology. And so let's kind of start with the strength side, which is when you guys are, obviously you're probably starting with plyometrics in a program right away. You can start with some jumping and stuff. What is your goal of plyometrics and force loading and stuff like that versus me and Dan can talk about when we start to reintroduce that, how do we do that in a way that's kind of lower risk? Let's go, uh, Duesh. Um, yeah, so <laughs> it goes back to the needs analysis. <laughs> what, what, what does the athlete need a little bit more of? Um, and I, and I think Jonah was spot on with the whole semantics thing of understanding our labels a little bit more, right? I, I, I think certain examples would be the, the industry often 
interchanging words like force and power, whereas, you know, power is actually, or force is one of the variables of power. Um, things like interchanging, plyometrics and jumping, stuff like that. Um, so we do have to be a little bit more specific in our definitions and the way that we word things. Um, but to answer your question, we definitely have to look at the needs analysis. So we have an athlete, right? Let's say like a, like a football lineman. Well, they're probably going to need a little bit more true force production, right? They're trying to move another really big human out of the way or hold that really big human for a certain amount of time so that another smaller human that's way faster can get by. Um, right. That's kind of over simplifying football, but right there, but, um, that person's going to require way more force production. Whereas someone, let's say like a wide receiver or running back in football needs to be really, really speedy fast, right? Let's say it's a wide receiver. That's, um, you know, playing the deep ball. A lot of times needs to be able to jump really high to contest for a ball up in the air. They're going to need way more true velocity and maybe a little bit more, um, along the, the max power spectrum. So our plyometrics or our jumping drills are going to have to be programmed specifically. So maybe for that lineman, um, there's going to be a little bit more of an emphasis on movements that are high force production, right? Examples being, um, you know, speed squats, maybe really heavy weighted jumps, like heavy power cleans, heavy snatches, right? Stuff like that. Uh, if they're doing med ball stuff, like maybe really he heavy med ball stuff, so it's a little bit more force dominant. Whereas the meat and potatoes, at least closer to competition for that wide receiver running back, probably has to be um, a little bit more of a high velocity movement, right? Maybe let's say more pogo type jumping, true plyometric movement, meaning very short amortization phase of load to unload, um, you know, plyo hurdle jumps, uh, repeated bounding, stuff like that is probably going to be the meat and potatoes of the program. Um, so again, it goes back to the needs analysis, figure out what the athlete needs more of. Um, and then you're just messing around with our dial system of if someone needs a little bit more force, they get a little bit more force, but does not mean that velocity disappears. Um, and then vice versa. Yeah. And I think that that concept is really important to understand. And maybe Jonah can say whatever he thinks and touch on this, but Jonah, obviously doing so much with the data collection and force plate stuff is when you guys test people, if you do jump testing and stuff, you're trying to understand on a force velocity curve, is this person more of a bouncier? Is this person more of a stronger athlete? And you're trying to program to fill in the gaps of athleticism, right? Whereas, you know, that's never, that's like literally never on our radar of, of, uh, you know, an ACL at six months. I'm not trying to hop test somebody to see if they're strong. I'm just like, this person just needs to jump, you know, period. So Jonah, can you share maybe what Duesh was talking about with the force velocity curve and how that applies to plyometrics, unless you had something else you want to share? Uh, yeah, I guess the one thing I would say, and this kind of ties into that is we want, I want to make sure that I'm choosing drills that allow to work on the aspect they need. So some of that can be the force velocity spectrum. So if you have an athlete who does really well compared to their peers with light movements that happen really fast, uh, then maybe for them, we want to work on those slightly heavier movements that are naturally going to move a little bit slower. So an example of this that we use with our baseball athletes is we'll test guys with like a two and a six pound med ball or a four and an eight pound med ball. And if you take two athletes and one is much better with the four than the other, and then that other guy is much better with the eight than the person who is good with the four, for the person who struggles with the lighter med balls, we're going to want to emphasize more of those light med balls because that's what they struggle with. Um, whereas for the person who does really, really well um, with the light med balls, we might want to work on more force output. So using some heavier stuff, similar application can be done with jumping where if we're comparing a counter movement jump and a squat jump for somebody who has a really big difference between the two, uh, means like their concentric power or their squat jump abilities aren't very good. So we're going to want to target more of that stuff. So for them, we might do a trap bar jump off of blocks. So they're starting from a dead stop and having to produce their power from there. Whereas for the athlete where they're very close together, we're going to want to work on more true plyometrics or something like a trap bar jump with a counter movement so that they actually have to work on that spectrum of it. And then the last piece I think to consider is, are we trying to work overall outputs or are we trying to work on more of like that application to sport so say again i'll use just a baseball example because it's easy um, if we have two pitchers both throw similarly hard and one is significantly better than the other when it comes to all our power metrics so when we do jumps things like that they are way better um, odds are what they need to work on is more of the sport specific side they need to learn how to apply that force and that power to the movements they do in their sport. So they might have an extra high volume of med ball work or even within the jump training they do, it might be 
higher complexity exercises. So it's challenging their coordination and their ability to use that power in a wider variety of movements. We don't just want them to be good at doing counter movement jumps on a force plate. We want them to be able to use that in a wider uh, spectrum of activities. Whereas for the other person, if they're really, really good at their sport, if you look at them from like just a general output level and they can't jump that high um, or they're not that strong or any of those sort of things, then we can keep their exercises way more general. Maybe all they need to do is repeated vertical jumps where they just jump as high as they can four times in a row or uh, a weighted seated vertical jump or things like that where they're not that complex so that all they have to focus on is trying really hard so that we can bring up those overall outputs. Yeah. And that makes sense, right? Like, so for your point of view, and we'll kind of summarize this and hold it in one half and Dan can maybe talk about his, which is you guys have more of a, a needs analysis and understanding what that person needs more of to fill in all the general buckets of athleticism for plyometrics and power, which is, are you more of a force athlete? Are you more of a velocity athlete? What does your sport require of you? What position within that sport do you play? And you're trying to just build them up generally to be more explosive, more plyometric as a whole, right? Is that, is that kind of a good summary there? Yeah. 100%. Okay, cool. So let's hold that on one side. So like Dan, I mean, it's hilarious because like I can't think of a much more different approach than we have on the rehab side when we program plyometrics and running. So that athlete say is five months out now and they had a meniscus and they're cleared to run and everything's good. When you look at trying to get somebody back to jumping, running plyometrics, what's on your mind for the goal? And then how do you approach that? Yeah, for sure. Um, I guess to answer your question, I'm thinking about this quite a bit before that, right? So using that example of ACL reconstruction athlete, and it really goes for any sort of knee surgery, your ability to jump and land well is really based around your quad strength, right? And there's a bunch of research to show that your function improves big time if your quad is strong enough. So I'm not jumping at the very beginning of a rehab, right? But we know that that's an eventual need, right? We know we're going to have to get to the point where Duesh and Jonah can look at the jump and figure out what needs to be optimized, right? So we have to get to the point where you can jump and land well, right? Uh, and then for me, that kind of starts with, all right, we need to make sure the quad gets strong. And then once we're able to tolerate single-legged exercises, uh, I love single-legged squats, single-legged deadlifts. One of my favorites is a skater squat because it kind of mimics a lot of the single-legged jumping and landing mechanics. And for, let's say, ACL reconstruction, hop testing is huge, right? Um, often makes up a battery of tests that you return to, you decide whether or not your athlete's ready to return to sport. So if you can do a skater squat really well, at least in my mind, you have the beginnings of being able to jump and land. So we build up the quad strength. And then we get good at things like skater jumps. And then we actually practice the act of jumping, which is kind of hilarious, right? And I usually start with a box jump that is very box jump level. That is very embarrassing for the patient, right? It's like four to six inches. And, and honestly, I'm a common, theme, that. a common theme in step ups and just whatever's the most embarrassing. Right? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Dan likes um, to embarrass people. <laughs> yeah. It, it, well, I mean, part of it is like, you're trying to introduce this stress as soon as it's safe. Right. And oftentimes that means you regress it to the point where it is embarrassing. But I think that because you're introducing it at an embarrassing level, you're setting some up for better success later. Right. So when we introduce impact, it's similar to introducing, let's say, loading. We start with bilateral first. So I often do an assisted pogo jump. So if a pogo jump wasn't embarrassing enough, we make it a little less stressful and more embarrassing by having them hold on to a band that's attached to a rig and get some tolerance to jumping and landing there. And once they prove some tolerance to that, then we're doing bilateral jumping. And usually it's embarrassingly low level for box jump in front of a mirror. We're very concerned with biomechanics, right? Are we landing with enough knee flexion? Are we, you know, taking our weight and pushing it towards our non-operative side, right? Are we flexing the knee enough, right? Uh, so we're trying to coach someone through that. And once we're at the point now that we can do single-legged jumping, so they've proven some tolerance to, let's say, some skater squats, some single-legged squats, They've proven some tolerance to impact with bilateral loading. Now we start the same thing with the single legged jump, right? And the big thing is I'm concerned with motor control and technique. So the last thing I'm thinking about is power. And I'll tell the athletes I'm working on or working with is that the intent is not to produce as much power as you can, which is sometimes important because when you tell someone to jump, they're thinking, let's get high, let's explode, right? But that's not what we want at all, right? So the intent is completely different. It's like, make this look really good. Make sure you land well. And I often have people do like fake jump reps, which is essentially like go into your landing position in a single leg. And then from there, I want you to jump. And when you land, try to find that really good landing position again that you just created without the jump. Right. And then we step off a box and we practice landing as well. Right. So we're, we're working on creating the power, 
and also are working on braking or deceleration, right? And then once we have the foundation of those things, we just start to progress. So I usually start with something like a box jump. We, in, we increase the height a little bit. We do like a, an altitude landing on one leg, depth drop, whatever you want to call it. And as you can tolerate that well, we jump over, let's say, a small hurdle. Uh, we make it very um, non-reactive. It's kind of like a jump with a stick. Make sure that lane looks really good. Reset, jump again. When, once that's being tolerated well, we start incorporating kind of like a, a faster, more reactive jump where you're jumping, landing, jumping, landing a little more quickly. Uh, eventually, we start incorporating more planes of motion, so jumping and turning. And I think we make it more reactive by adding things like blaze pods, right? We, we make, a, make it more challenging from a neurocognitive demand. And I think the last piece is like we're trying to put um, more capacity on this, right? Because we need to make sure we jump well. But if you look at most sports, they're not like 15 minutes long, right, for you know, a given activity. Like it's going to last longer, and you have to be able to tolerate, let's say, thousands of impacts, so you have to start bridging that gap. We need to get the conditioning down in a sports specific capacity, you know? Yeah, absolutely. That's a super helpful way to kind of think about it. Whereas again, comparing it to what Jonah said is we're very much trying to restore symmetry in the baseline level of the ability to jump well and equally on each side from a movement quality point of view first to make sure we're protecting the injured site. But then we're going to progress things in a very like, I don't know, basic and linear fashion, just to just increase demand, right? Whether it's low to medium to higher intensity hurdle jumps, or whether it's like, like you said, a double legged jump and stick to a connected double leg to a single leg jump and stick to a single leg connected. And then for like running or plyometrics forwards, right? It's like running front to back, running side to side, getting that mastered, then running change of directions, then letting that be the reaction. Because that just increases the load on the on the knee itself or the whatever joint you're working on but then also obviously it's cognitively much more challenging to do a more advanced version of that so yeah i think that's super helpful and then i guess the last thing to wrap it up with is just to counterbalance that that plyometric progression is duesh how are you viewing the progressions of plyometrics and progressions of things from a sports performance goal and then we can probably just wrap it up yeah the it goes back to the needs analysis again <laughs> <laughs> Does it require the highest amount of force or highest amount of velocity? <laughs> that Dan likes to embarrass people in direct <laughs> analysis. Yeah. Um, Quad looks like a bowl of mashed potatoes. Yeah. I like the gravy. Embarrassingly low. Yeah. The, the gravy one was the best. The mashed potato with the gravy was awesome. Um, That's a neat it's <laughs> <laughs> Um Yeah. No, it's uh, the, the progression is just going to be dictated by do we want to push the, the more resisted, the higher force demanding type supply metrics or jumps, um, I should say, or do we need to push the really, really rapid contractions with a very short load phase um, and really push the velocity end of things, um, right? Or let's say we're going to relate it to a sprinter, which is a plyometric over and over again every time they're sprinting. Um, yeah, do we need that max, max top end speed or do we need somewhere in the middle of, you know, force and speed or do we need something that's a little bit more true force? Um, that's how we progress it. And I think to add on to that, Joan already kind of mentioned it, but the complexity also matters. Um, does the athlete have demands of needing to do complex movements that require high velocity, high force, or does they require minimal complexity, um, of high force and high velocity combined? So dig it. I dig it. Well, I think we kind of got, Oh, go Jonah. Just one quick thing that kind of came to mind as I was listening to Dan talk to almost summarize everything is, Hearing the way you guys are progressing, your goal is, okay, you can tolerate this. Awesome. Let's move on to something that's more stressful. Okay, you can tolerate that now. Awesome. Here's the next step. Whereas the way we do it is, okay, you can goblet squat this much weight now. Awesome. Now just go pick up a heavier weight. Or you can jump onto this box. Awesome. Now just go get a higher box where we're still progressing things over time, but we're not just instantly trying to apply more stress to the tissue. We are allowing the athlete to slow cook for a little bit longer and just developing things in that way. And I feel like that almost summarizes the difference between the two sides. Yeah, no, I dig it. I think that's a really good way to kind of to leave it as is, but um, yeah, I think a lot of that is, is interesting to hear because there's some things that I didn't really think about that make more sense to me now, but also some things that I think are much more overlapping between the two than different, which I think a lot of people will find valuable, right? Between those two timeframes. So yeah, let's just wrap it up maybe and kind of go around one person each and just say, you know, like, what are your recommendations for if you're, a, you know, on Dan's side, a rehab provider who's swimming in the, in the world of programming. And then you guys can talk about like, you know, new grads or people who are working with those who are coming off injury, stuff like that, which might be intimidating. So Dan, what are your thoughts? 
Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't know. I think sometimes I think there's a little too much information out there, especially when you're starting off, you know, and I've gotten a lot of different advice over the course of time. Um, the advice of to learn everything. Right. And then I've, I've gotten the contrary advice of pick a few people that you really jive with and just really learn what they're doing and apply it really well and then move on. And I actually think in the beginning, that might be your best bet, right? Find a few folks you really like, right? Obviously at the champion, we produce a ton of content. Uh, we think we have decent stuff, obviously. Right. Um, but you have the Mike Boyles of the world, right? Eric Kresge. I learned a ton from Eric, you know, uh, Joe DeFranco was one of my early influences. I learned a lot from like the West side powerlifting guys. Just choose a few that you Charlie. think are really good. Charlie and go deeper and develop your own system really well. And then once you have a really good system that works well for you, then you can start expanding a little bit uh, and you'll have a little bit of experience in order to set yourself as a foundation to try new things, as opposed to learning everything and being very confused about how to put that all together into one system, you know? Yeah. Dig it too, Ash. Yeah. I would say my, my two biggest pieces of advice for the early professional um, one would be honestly a lot of what we talked about this podcast, as far as the patterns go, right. I often got questions from interns of why do we not just start with the exercise, right? Cause they, they come in all excited. They know, you know, hundreds of different exercises to plug into a program. They get excited about that exercise cause it's cool. Or, you know, they found it new on Instagram and it's, and it's appealing or whatever. Um, but I think one of the biggest things that they miss is organization of thoughts and organizations on how to progress. Um, so a system to organize that works really well is just looking at things very generally from a pattern standpoint and then plugging in specific exercises or, or drills or whatever that kind of fit within that pattern. So now your organization system is way more clear. There's way more of a, you know, decisive picking of what to do when. Um, so I would say that's one really big one. And then the other one um, semi related is almost a little bit more of a, a skill set. Um, and I say this one a lot too, to a lot of our younger coaches, but also interns is have the ability to kind of zoom in and zoom out very rapidly. Um, and very often, what I mean by that is let's say you're writing a program and you're kind of getting stuck in like, let's say just our speed section. All right. I'm trying to get someone faster in this program. Um, I want to really kind of dive in on the speed. Well, don't just get stuck there. Cause there's going to be, ha there's going to be a time where you're going to have to step out, look at that entire day as a whole and say, all right, here's my speed drills that I'm using to develop speed. But what are the other exercises within, let's say maybe my strength section, that's going to actually aid in the development of that speed. Right. And then on that same boat, we can even zoom out a little bit further and say, all right, let me look at this entire week and see how I'm splitting up some of my drills for speed development. And how does that relate in terms of my strength stuff on, one day, all the other days. And then maybe I even zoom out a little bit further and say, all right, what was my entire last three month phase of training? Was that a success? Do I need to zoom out that far to say, all right, was there anything missing from that block that I may maybe need to go back in on um, and, you know, plug stuff in there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that rapid zoom in, zoom out, the often uh, zoom in, zoom out is a really important tool to be able to, to develop as a coach. Yeah, I dig it. Very good advice. Jonah, what are your thoughts? I'd say just get as much hands-on experience as you can in as many different ways as you can. Um, all this nerdy stuff we just talked about, understanding programming, all that is great. But if when somebody goes to do a split squat and they're putting more stress on their knee because they're turning it into a very knee dominant version and you don't want that, if you can't coach them out of it, it doesn't matter how smart you are. <laughs> it really just doesn't matter. So I would say do like try to do a strength and conditioning internship at some point if you can. If you're going the PT route, if you're going the SNC route, try to get some experience working in a rehab setting or being an aide or doing something along those lines. Coach a local sports team, like whatever it is, the more different ways you have to just help other people move better, that's going to go such a long way to actually applying all this knowledge. Saying, like, yeah, you learn how to program, and until you're actually writing programs for people, you go to write that first one and you're like, Oh my God, I know 12 different periodization methods. I know this, I know that now I got to turn it all into a two day program. And so get the hands-on experience doing those things. Don't just look in a textbook. Or the most classic example of you write this, like what you think is like a godlike program with all these exercises. And the person walks in and can't do Jack. And you're just like, oh, <laughs> that's not what I thought was going to happen. <laughs> you know, yeah. You got to like, reroute on the fly. So yeah, Dan, you have something. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I guess be prepared to be punched in the face, you know. Um, sometimes, like, 
I don't know. I have an athlete that comes in and squatting, right? And their knee hurts. I'm like, oh yeah, we're going to make this person squat with no pain. All right, try this box squat and send your hips back. And they do it. And they're like, oh, that's excruciating pain. And then I'm like, all right, well, let's try maybe front squat. And they're like, oh, it feels great. And like it flies completely in the face of all the <laughs> principles that I talked about. But it does happen from time to time, right? So yeah. principles do work generally, but also be prepared for when there's those oddballs. And that's just part of it. And that's okay. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's important, right. To, to think about not textbook based stuff, which I think goes back to my first thought I was going to have, which is why it's so important to understand what are all the variables you can manipulate, right? Like a, a split squat that's not tolerated well, can be range of motion, tempo, pause, load, density, sets, reps, like play around with all those variables and see which one of those maybe is tolerated. Well, maybe it's less load, more BFR and metabolic stress is the way they tolerate it. And I think the most important takeaway for me is you have to, as a physical therapist and as a strength coach, really understand what a normal versus abnormal response to exercise is. I think sometimes that's where a lot of strength coaches maybe get in hot water in terms of soreness versus what's actually starting to get a little dicey on like a tendinopathy versus strength or PTs underdose chronically and don't really know that it's okay to be sore. It's okay to be tired. It's okay to let someone struggle a little bit. It's okay to get a sweat on and kind of, you know, have a, have a, a challenge. That's what it's for. But you should never have an abnormal response to exercise that, you know, someone's knee gets real swollen or pain lasts for more than 24 to 48 hours or three out of a 10 is kind of a good little marker of like, you know, what's tolerable discomfort. It should never be this like really sharp, bright pinpoint pain. And if it is this thing, these things happen, like all, you know, all of us here have probably made a, a mistake. We read a program that we think is going to be tolerated well, and it doesn't get tolerated at all. And, you know, Dan and I flare somebody up pretty bad. Um, and we got to just be like, Oh, you know, we, we tried this, we thought it'd be good, but it isn't, but we'll take a step back and do that. But if you don't know what normal soreness is versus pain in someone's knee joint, you're going to really have a tough time striking that balance of the proper dosage of load. So, yeah. Well, gents, any parting thoughts? I think that was pretty good. That was a very helpful episode. I think for a lot of people, which one of us is punching Dan in the face on Monday to make sure he's prepared. Not it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want that. I don't want to do it. Dewey, it's on you. I'll, I'll, I'll bring him mashed potatoes as a, as a condolence to, to the broken nose. Yeah. So Dave will punch me in the face and then do will just throw mashed potatoes at me. <laughs> Sounds happened? like an exciting Monday. I feel well, like we should, we should televise this. Instagram reels sure. ready to go. Uh, yeah. But no, guys, thank you so much because I think that, you know, again, that, that is by this point in our careers when working together so long, we have great mentors and a great space. It's kind of second nature to us and we understand that really well. But I think for a lot of new grads, a lot of young strength coaches, this episode will be replayed quite a few times and kind of, you know, kind of comb back over for some good stuff. So yeah, I appreciate it. And uh, if you guys don't have anything else to add, we'll just chop it there and then you guys can have a great weekend. Chopperoo. All right, Jim. <laughs> thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. Thank you.